Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is a hot topic as of late. From the new Pokemon making a splash in League play, to the music being an absolute banger, to one of the best stories of any Pokemon game, full stop, it is definitely worth celebrating. Heck, you'd probably expect me to join the fray and make another video praising the game. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I like the game. As I said, the new Pokemon, overarching story, the school, they're all worth admiring. It's just several things holding it back that has the previous generation as my favorite Pokemon game. Yes, I'm serious. I think Sword and Shield are better games than Scarlet and Violet, don't at me. To prove it, I'm going to list 10 things in Gen 9 that frustrated me to no end while traversing the Paldea region. Number 10. The Open World. I'll give props to the Paldea region. Going open world made the country your cloister. You have full range to explore, collect items, battle Pokemon and trainers, and with the assistance of your legendary bike, traverse impossible terrain you couldn't otherwise do in previous generations. That being said, there are drawbacks to becoming the next Breath of the Wild. For starters, you have to interact with Pokemon on the map in order to catch them, instead of just walking into tall grass as you'd normally do. You will run into them unknowingly because you can't see them as they pop into frame, or a herd of them will come charging at you and you're stuck in an endless loop of Pokemon battles. Have fun with Paldean Tauros. They're relentless. Second, the map can be a little confusing as to where caves start and end. With how bad the lighting is in some areas, it could be hard to find your way out. And speaking of caves, the world's most dangerous cave to Alfernada is no joke. In order to get to Alfernada, you have to traverse through an overleveled cave just to get to the Psychic Gym area. Pokemon Violet Trainers have it worse, because if you want to get Sinistee Chips for the Malicious Armor, the best spot to get said chips is on a cliff near Alfernada. So have fun traveling through the Murder Cave and then trying to battle Sinistee and Poltegeist, and not use them because they're not at the correct level to use in battle. I'll talk a bit more about this mechanic later, but I'll cap off this section by saying it could be quite easy to stumble into an overleveled area if you're not careful. Number 9. Performance Issues Yeah, you thought this would be towards the top, but nope! There are things worse than glitches, both hilarious and game-breaking. To say the game is horribly optimized is nothing new. Personally, I have never had issues with the hilarious or game-breaking bugs. No, my issue was slow down. It was quite apparent at the beginning as you made your way through Los Platos. People could be walking and talking, and you'd notice they're walking at 4 frames per second from a distance. Homeroom at the Academy is no different, as several of your fellow students are lagging out trying to kick their legs in excitement. The worst example, however, is Brassius's and Tulip's gym challenges. There are too many moving parts in the background that will hinder your Switch's performance. I'm just glad mine didn't overheat, causing the game to crash. Fingers crossed the DLC will run smoother than what we got in the base game. Oh, and can we please fix the boxes? I want to be able to locate my Pokémon in an instant and not wait for their sprites to pop in after three seconds, thank you very much. Number 8. Gym Battles Okay, hear me out, there is nothing wrong with the mechanics of battling. It's something we haven't seen in previous Pokémon games where you fight a leader and their Pokémon, with some gimmicks surrounding the last one in their party. I do, however, take issue with the challenges. Only half of them are actually worth playing. The Olive Roll, Where's Clavel, the Hidden Menu Item, and the Slalom are fun, and I would love to replay them at any time. Sunflower Hide and Seek, Dendra Says, the Auction House, and the Warm Up Act are not worth your time. But that's just my opinion. I'm sure there are people who like the Auction House idea, or found the controls of the Slalom too tight. But here's something I think most people can agree on regarding not just the gym battles, but the path of progression for every story. The game lies to you. As much as the game promotes its open-world mechanic, it is still very linear in its playstyle. There is, in fact, a set path of progression for players to follow, starting at Katie's Gym in Cortando, and ending your journey at Calf Squad's base. If you want to start your gym experience taking on Grusha at the Glaciato Gym, you technically can, you'd just be in for a world of hurt if you started at the 8th gym, 
or you wanted to tackle Ares Starbase in the Northern Province first on Starfall Street. After nearly four hours of grinding, you can finally defeat them. But once you win and try on another leader or boss for size... Anyone else feel like we overtrained for this? Now, wouldn't it have been better if, when battling the gyms and Team Star bosses, they leveled up the difficulty along with your progression? Imagine going up against Katie last, and she actually did go all out with her bug Pokémon. Or having Ortega be your first go at Team Star, and his Azumarill isn't a pain in the ass at the start. That is what I wanted from Pokémon's next step forward. Instead, we have a set path as always, despite the game giving you the option to start anywhere. Number 7. The Box Legendary Pokémon Okay, I'm not making any friends on this one, but I want to make a quick preface and say, I love my Robo Puppy! I am that Brooklyn Nine-Nine meme with the Retriever Puppies if anything happened to them. He's a good boy, and I will give him all my sandwiches! This is the first game in the franchise where you start off with a Box Legendary Pokémon in your party. You find your respective Rhydon on a beach in a weakened state, until you feed them the sandwich your mom made. After you beat Arvin, he gives you the Pokeball left by the Professor, and the legendary Pokémon becomes your primary mode of transport. Along the path of Legend Story, you find Herba Mystica to help regain their strength, unlocking new abilities, like swimming, gliding, climbing, and jumping good. They'll also be able to beat its superior in the endgame, unlocking its true potential. You help regain its legendary status. Kinda. See, this has been bothering me for the longest time since I beat the main story. Do Miraidon and Koraidon really count as legendary Pokémon? Yeah, they're on the box like all the other legendaries, minus Gen 1, but something feels off calling them legendary Pokémon. For the record, it's not the interactivity with them. Cub Fu and the Armor Isle DLC of Gen 8 has the same interactive mechanics, but at least they had some mythos to go along with that. Cub Fu served as companions for traders and explorers until they naturalized to the mountain regions. Heck, Cosmog, aka Nevi from Sun and Moon, despite your trainer not raising it, is from another dimension, and there's no other Pokémon like them. Koraidon and Miraidon? They're the ancestors and descendants of Cyclozar, a Pokémon that exists in the present. The time travel beats in Scarlet and Violet hampers any mystery other than where do these Pokémon come from and why does it look so similar to a Pokémon that already exists? Also, does this confirm Darwinian evolution exists in Pokémon given the past Paradox Pokémon in Scarlet? And how do future Paradox Pokémon come to be? Is it really as simple as Iron Jugulus's Scarlet Pokédex entry, when a mommy Pokémon and a daddy robot love each other very much, or...? Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. Number 6. Noticeable Subtractions Every generation of Pokémon makes changes to improve the gameplay. The physical special split in Gen 4, the removal of HMs in Gen 7, and the introduction of alternate forms in Gen 6 all made the games better. So, did anyone notice that certain features introduced in previous generations were either reduced or removed entirely in Scarlet and Violet? First, there's Double Battles, introduced in Ruby and Sapphire. This was a unique battle mechanic that introduced more strategy when a second or even a third Pokémon is introduced on your side of the field. They usually introduce the mechanic early and often to prepare you for an eventual double battle in a gym or against the villain general. Gen 9 doesn't do that. In fact, there's only one area in the entire game that does double battles, and that's at the Montanavera gym against Rhine. The village way up in the mountains is usually tackled toward the end of the victory road path, and they only now introduce the mechanic. Hell, Dendra, your battle studies teacher, doesn't even teach the mechanic after you complete the midterms. Imagine this is your first Pokémon game, and you're introduced to a mechanic so late in the game, catches you off guard, and it's never used anywhere else, you wonder if it should have just been removed completely. And speaking of removal in its entirety, why did you abscond with the Pokéjob system? The Pokéjob system introduced in Sword and Shield was an underrated mechanic that helped level up your box Pokémon so they're not just sitting there taking up space. They gain experience and train for the day, get you cash and other items depending on which Pokémon you designate for assignment, and you can assign them for IV training to boost their individual stats. 
Scarlet and Violet took one look at that and said, yeah! and went back to traditional grinding for experience. There's one other notable subtraction, but let's wait until we get to that entry a little later. <laughs> Number 5, League Champion Gita. This is nothing new. I, along with others, are beating a fainted Mudsdale when we say, Gita is the worst Pokémon champion of any region. Let's count the ways she's an awful champion. First of all, she's in charge of the Pokémon League and holds each gym leader to her standards. Two, she designates you to do yearly inspections while setting up the Ace Academy tournament, where you find out she's very unpopular with the gym leaders. Three, she overworks Larry to where he needs to work three jobs, the Modality gym leader, an Elite Four member, and his actual job. Fourth, and probably the most obvious one, her team sucks! It's no joke when I say I had more of a challenge fighting Poppy, Larry, and Hassel in the Elite Four than her joke of a team. Avalug and Goko? Really? I refer you back to my Mudsdale comment where I need to reiterate, why doesn't she start with her Glamora? Glamora has the ability Toxic Debris, which puts Toxic Spikes on your side of the field every time it takes damage from your Pokémon. It gives you a challenge to rework a strategy, since there is an environmental hazard on the field. If she's supposed to be the best, shouldn't she also provide the biggest challenge? Raihan from Gower got that down by having Pokémon that affected the weather and resisted it, having you and your Pokémon adapt to the new surroundings. Hell, I could easily fix her team. Let's say she starts off with Palafin, which replaces her Belooza. She then uses Flip Turn, thanks to a Quick Claw, to send out her Glamora, and you end up dealing damage to it. Toxic Spikes are now on the field, and now you have to deal with that. Afterward, she'll send out her Hero Form Palafin, she can keep her as Bathra, change Avalug and Go-Go to Tyranitar with Sandstream, or Dragapult with Infiltrator, and the Charconet Evolution opposite the game you're playing. King Gambit is her Ace, with a Dark Terraform giving stabs a Kotal Cleave, but also knowing the move Retaliate, which increases the amount of damage if a Pokémon faints beforehand. It also will keep the ability Supreme Overlord, which increases the attack of the Pokémon for each of its allies that have fallen in battle. Or, if you really want to mess with the trainers, trade out her Espathra for Rabska, one of only two Pokémon that know Revival Blessing, and then revive her Glamora again. There, I fixed the worst League Champion. Let's move on. Number 4, The Treasures of Ruin Side Quest. After you complete classes and the final exams, your history teacher, Reifert, has you embark on a quest to find the Treasures of Ruin. There are four stolen treasures from another region, more than likely the Pokémon equivalent of China, that corrupted and transformed into Pokémon. A vessel, a sword, beads, and a tablet. Now that's what I'm talking about when it comes to Legends of Pokémon. So, how do we get them? Well, Ryford puts four shrine locations on your map, located in each region of Paldea. The only way to open the shrines is to remove eight stakes planted into the ground for each region. Once the stakes are removed, the shrine opens and out pops the snail, stag, snow leopard, and fish. With all of this lore behind these out-of-place Pokémon, is it worth it to retrieve the corrupted treasures? <laughs> INCORRECT! This quest was a pain in the ass to complete! For starters, finding the stakes is nigh impossible without a guide. I guarantee you will spend up to an hour or more trying to find the stakes in the ground for just one of the mythical legendary Pokémon. You'll either be trying to remember which stakes you uprooted, or trying to discern which locations are actually shown in guide pictures. Even then, the guides are unhelpful. It took me nearly a half hour to find one location because the cave wasn't properly specified in the description. Once you free the Pokémon, they emerge with Lake Spirit Syndrome, because unless you put some status effect on them like Sleep or Paralysis, your catch rate will range between 4 and 8%. So have fun chucking all your Ultra Balls and Dust Balls at them until you give up and use Timer Balls, which almost never work. Once you FINALLY catch all four treasures, Ryper gives you the TM for Nasty Plot, which sharply raises the special attack of your Pokémon. Unfortunately, the only treasure of rune worth teaching it to is the Goldfish, which has an insane special attack stat. But are they worth using in battle? Eh, not really. 
Now, they all have the move Ruination, and each Pokémon have a strong stat total of 570. But that's small potatoes when you could catch and raise Dragapult, Kudra, Tyranitar, Hydreigon, Garchomp, Dragonite, Salamence, Heroform Palafin, and the new pseudo-legendary Backscalibur, all of whom have a stat total of 600 or more. Not to mention, the Paradox Pokémon you find in Area Zero also have the same stat totals as the treasures, and are not as hard to catch, with an abundance of them everywhere. Also, don't try to use these guys in terror raids or double battles. Their special abilities lower one stat by 25% for all Pokémon on the field except yours. Needless to say, the secondary legendaries are not worth catching, and you could be spending your time better preparing for Area Zero. Number 3. TMs and crafting. So, this is the other thing that was removed that I have more to say on. Technical machines are no longer reusable. Gen 8 had TMs be reusable while introducing technical records as one use only. The benefit is during the max raids, you collect TRs depending on the Pokémon's type. So, with the TMs being one use only again, how do they make up for it? Well, there is some good news as the TMs respawn after one day. If you don't want to wait, Gen 9 introduced TM Crafting, which is considerably worse. After battling Pokémon in the wild, you'll notice each Pokémon will drop something that's a part of them, like a tuft of fur, or as I mentioned in the number 10 entry, Sinistee Chips. These could be used as crafting materials for TMs to create and use for your Pokémon. Except in order to unlock certain TMs at the crafting station, you have to either find them in the wild, or you have to wait until you're given TMs by the gym leaders, league reps, and team star bosses. Plus, all of the materials for the TMs are not listed until you find the Pokémon in the wild that has the materials you need. This forces you to grind slash complete the Pokédex in order to unlock the materials for the TMs. By the way, this just occurred to me while I was typing up this section. The crafting system is demented! Think about this for a second. You're battling a Pokémon with the intent to catch it or gain experience. As you do, you are physically damaging it with either your Pokémon's moves or throwing a Pokéball at it. Once you defeat or catch it, you're collecting items that came from the Pokémon's defeat. Oh! 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 What the hell is wrong with you? This is why PETA gains unwanted attention towards the franchise. Number 2. Picnics. If there was one thing I was looking forward to in Gen 9 the most, it was the ability to interact with my Pokémon in downtime. I want to play with my Pokémon, care for them, and finally use the newest food mechanic, making SANDWICH! Boy, was this a disappointment. Yes, you do interact with your Pokémon individually. You get to wash them so they're squeaky clean, and you could greet them to level up their friendliness towards you as always. However, Sword and Shield gave the opportunity to interact one-on-one -on -one with your Pokémon more. It felt more caring when you called over one or two Pokémon to help gain their trust and boost their friendliness stats. Plus, it was endearing to see your Pokémon develop relationships with each other, seeing them race or chat amongst themselves. Playing with your Pokémon in Scarlet and Violet results in up to seven of your team playing soccer with you. While it is fun to attempt to kick an exercise ball, it doesn't give a lot of experience for your Pokémon. You'll also more than likely lose the ball, and you'll have to manually retrieve it. So, why do the picnics? Well, there's the sandwich making. Now, instead of having your Pokémon heal up and restore their movesets, as with the curry and galler, the sandwiches give bonuses depending on which ingredients you use. They can boost egg power, by the way, I forgot to mention breeding takes place during picnics now, increase item drops during raids, or change the abundance of Pokémon types appearing in the wild, including the size of said Pokémon. The drawback? Sandwich making is a damn physics puzzle! The last thing I wanted to do is play Jenga with my subs. I mean, can't a trainer just relax making food for yourself and your Pokémon and not worry about gravity? Or depth perception? Or failure? Or anxiety over the food's quality? I mean, I'll give it this. It's not Poffin baking. Before we get to number one, here are some dishonorable mentions. The Sweet Herba Mystica quest from Saguaro. This one is a bit more luck-based finding them in the Terror Raids, and even if you don't find the right Herba Mystica, you still get a ton of goodies. 
Starbase Raids. While neat, it does get repetitive, and I feel the grunt music should be played here instead of the opening battle. Pokemon Centers are now kiosks. I miss the buildings. In-game clock and weather! This honestly would be number 11, but this came to me as just missing catching Pokemon in certain weather conditions and having my game clock match real time. The Dunsparce! That's it, just the Dunsparce's existence. Number 1. Terastalizing. Everything that is wrong with Scarlet and Violet comes down to how bad this game mechanic is. First of all, what is Terastalizing? It's a new gameplay mechanic that changes the type of a Pokemon to a single type, either as an additional offensive stab boost to moves, or a defensive one to cover a weakness. It also gives your Pokemon a new hat. I like the concept of it. In practice, however, everything falls apart! So everyone remembers how cool the max raids were in the Galar region? You and three other people take on a giant or gigantic Pokémon to capture and earn goodies along the way. Fade four times or fail to catch it in ten rounds, and you're out. In Paldea, it's similar in staging. You and three others take on a Pokémon to catch, but you're on a visible time limit. And each time your Pokémon faints, a time penalty is implemented, and you lose out on your chance to beat those Pokémon. If you go in with friends or other players online, you will hit slowdown as you wait to see who's actually attacking, or try and select an action while the terror Pokémon makes 4 or 5 actions before you, and all you want to do is raise your damn attack stat! If you go in solo, it's even worse. If your Pokémon faints in battle, the NPC partners have to wait for you to return in order to attack again, wasting precious time. There are 4 and 5 star raids that are just on there. Those Pokémon in the increased level raids? They cheat. For one, they can steal your Terra Orb energy! Yeah, have fun trying to get another few attacks in so you can Terrasalize because they essentially stole a turn from you. The 6 and 7 star raids also allow those raid Pokémon to use up to 6 moves. When you're on a time limit with limited cheers to help your team's stats, as well as the game cheating, it turns you away from tackling the raids. Except you need to do the raids in order to get experience candy to level up your Pokémon, as well as the Terra Shards to change the Terra forms of your Pokémon. You see this Kilowattrel? His name is Max. He used to have a Flying Terra form, but I wanted to change it to Electric so I can avoid Flying-type weaknesses as I Terrasalize. So I look on the map to see if I can find Electric Terra Raids, and hope it's a 4 or 5 star raid. So I battle, beat the Pokémon because of luck, and gain the Terra Shards along with other stuff. Do you know how many shards are required to change the Terra type at the Treasure Eatery in Madali? Well, it's probably a reasonable number, like 20 or 30, given the number of shards dropped on the lower end of these raids, right? 50?! I need 50 of these fragments in order to change its form so I get a damn stab?! Not to mention, the 4-star raids don't drop more than 3 shards without boosts. Any raid below 3 stars, you don't get any. So, you decide to make a sandwich during your picnic to increase your raid power and gain more rewards. Well, better hope the sandwich you're making is perfect, because one errant cherry tomato rolling off as you place the bread down will change the type of sandwich to a you original, and you receive the lower boosts, if not completely different boosts than what you intended. Yes, yeah, Cerebi.net does list the ingredients that you can make to custom boost, but I want to feel accomplished when I make the larger sandwiches. Can you see how ingrained terrestrializing your Pokémon is to this list? From the sandwiches to slowdown, we can all attribute the faults of Pokémon Scarlet and Violet to this one game-destroying mechanic. <sighs> so, want to hear the good stuff? <laughs>